Well, the COVID-19 pandemic has made the homelessness crisis in New York City even worse. More people are living on the streets than ever before. Many forced out of their homes because they cannot afford to stay. Congressman Richie Torres from the Bronx has been working in Washington on programs to assist low-income families, keep them in their homes. He's joining us this morning from his apartment in the Bronx. It looks good, Congressman Torres. Maybe you need like a little flowers. <laughs> a plant. Yeah, a plant, <laughs> maybe a little picture behind you. What's going on in your apartment? I've been so busy, I, I've had no time to furnish it. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. Okay, there's a lot going on. Let's start, start talking about crime in the Bronx right now, because as you know, there is an uptick going on right now. And at one point, there was a big movement in this town to defund the police. Where did you stand on that, and do you still believe that? So there's no question that there's a crisis of gun violence in New York City and this, the Bronx has been the hardest hit um, from 2020 to 2021, year to date. The murder rate has risen by more than 40% in the Bronx, the number of shooting victims by more than 60%, the number of shooting incidents by more than 70%. Uh, to your question, the notion of radically defunding or even abolishing the police in the midst of gang violence and gun violence is profoundly irresponsible. You know, most Americans, most New Yorkers, want not less policing or even more policing, but better policing, more effective policing, more accountable and transparent policing. But part of the problem is gun trafficking, the flow of guns to New York City. State and local laws will only take us so far because guns move across state lines. Most of the guns we recover here in New York are from out of state. And so we need gun safety regulation at the national level, only that can break the flow of guns to New York City. Well, you guys are in power right now, so what are you going to do? Look, we've been providing aid to New York. So the United States Congress appropriated uh, $6 billion to the city of New York, and the government should use a share of those dollars to target at-risk youth because the dominant driver of gun violence is gang violence. There are thousands of young people who either don't go to work or don't go to school, whose existence is life on the streets, and we ought to provide those young people with mentoring and programming and employment to divert them from gang membership, to provide them with an alternative to gun violence, to, to life on the streets. Um, regarding gun trafficking, look, the, the greatest stumbling block on the path to gun safety is the filibuster. You know, in a rational world, every gun would be registered and safely stored. Every gun owner would be trained and licensed. Every gun sale would be subject to a background check. But there's nothing rational about a political system that enables one senator to filibuster gun safety at the expense of 330 million Americans. And that's the problem. Yeah, I understand that you probably do have a big hill to climb there regarding that. I mean, I know you give a three-part solution to this, jobs for the youth, better policing, federal gun law changes there. But the thing is, you don't want to spread yourself too thin, right? If you had to pick one of those to combat that crime right now to make an imperative difference, which one would that be? Well, investing in economic opportunity for young people is, is a longer-term undertaking. But for me, the, the single greatest policy change that we could pursue is to crack down on gun trafficking, which is one of the root causes of gun violence in New York City. Um, I think you do have a bone to pick, possibly, with the DOC. Uh, looking up some numbers, we spend about $338,000 a year per inmate here in the city. And those numbers are just kind of mind-boggling compared to when you look at how much you spend per a student in public school or how much you're giving to families in need or trying to protect their children from joining gang violence. What, what do you make of those numbers? Look, we, we spend... Too much on incarceration and too little on our young people. And look, when you starve a community of economic opportunity, those communities can become breeding ground for, for gang violence. A lack of opportunity makes young people susceptible to gang recruitment. So we have to create more programming, more mentoring. There's a model known as Cure Violence, which recruits violence interrupters to reach out to young people who are at risk of joining gangs and, and steer them in the right direction. Congressman, I, I know that you are very much in favor of housing vouchers. Tell us about that and how people um, can sign up. Yes, yeah, so, you know, our city is becoming so dangerously unaffordable. Uh, our country is becoming so dangerously unaffordable that there are 7 million Americans who are behind on their rents. 
Uh, there is no county in America where a minimum wage worker can afford a two bedroom apartment. And there are only seven out of 3,000 counties where a minimum wage worker can afford a one bedroom apartment. Uh, and so in order to address the affordability crisis, I'm introducing legislation uh, that would establish housing vouchers for all. So under my legislation, every family in need would receive a housing voucher, which ensures that you pay no more than 30% of your income toward your rent. Uh, housing vouchers for all would bring us closer than we've ever been to addressing the root cause of the affordability crisis and ending, ho ending homelessness here in New York City. I have one question to ask, though, is we see that we are increasing the minimum wage, but we've seen everything gone up in pricing. You can't stop that, that 2 to 3% increase in things going up every single year. So how does that actually play out? Look, we need to, uh, I think addressing the affordability crisis is a two-part equation. Not only do we need to regulate rents, but we also need to uh, bolster wages and ensure a strong labor market. And much of our fiscal and monetary policy has been aimed at stimulating the economy, creating jobs, bolstering wages so that people can afford to live in our country and our city. Yeah, speaking of uh, getting people working, uh, it seems like, and, and a lot of people are criticizing the federal government for the, the extra money and that, you know, a lot of people don't want to leave their couches to go back to work. Where do you stand on that? Look, Look, I, I'm, no, sure you, no I'm sure you see the signs in your neighborhood. I see the signs in my neighborhood. They're looking for everybody, you know, look, in stores and people, restaurants. Look, most of the people I know are, are, are working their heart out to sustain their families, are struggling to put food on the table and pay their bills. Many of them are single mothers. Many of them are the essential workers who put their lives at risk during the peak of the pandemic so that the rest of us could safely shelter in place. And we owe it to those workers to give them a fighting chance at a decent and dignified life. For me, the most transformational policy that Washington, D.C. has enacted has been the expansion of the child tax credit, which has cut child poverty by 50 percent. And I have legislation that would make it permanent. Well, we always appreciate having you on Good Day New York, Representative Richie Torres. We appreciate it. All the best to you. And bring home the bacon to New York, okay? Absolutely. Take I'm care. Sure. Next time we'll talk to you, you'll have a plant and a picture in the yeah, background. Yeah, at least a picture of somebody <laughs> behind you. Oh, brand new apartment. That's how it always goes. I know. All right.